What's up, everybody? This is Fred Ricciani of TSC. We have right here via Zoom a very special guest. He is an E1 artist. He is a songwriter, a producer, an entrepreneur. You can hear his music on AEW Dynamite, Rampage, and all kinds of AEW specials. We are talking to the multi-talented All Elite Wrestling's Mikey Ruckus. Mikey, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. How's everything going? Great. I have to tell you, that was a fantastic intro. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're very welcome. Listen, you do some kick-ass intros for the various wrestlers and personalities in AEW. Thought I'd try to return the favor just a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, man. Well, before we dive into everything you're currently doing right now, it's hard to believe, looking back right now, at the time we're recording this interview, three years of all elite wrestling. It's been three years since your life changed forever for the better. Can you just reflect a little bit on that and what this journey has been like for you? Yeah, it's it has been an amazing ride uh, ever since I joined the company in May of 2019. It has been like riding a lightning bolt. We have been absolutely full steam ahead since go. Uh, we haven't really looked back. Uh, we have a bright future ahead of us. Uh, things are broadening. Things are building steam even as we speak. And uh, it's just been an amazing ride. I've, I've learned a lot, not only about fans and and interaction but about uh presentation for live tv um there's a lot of things that you just you have theories of and then when you're thrown into the fire you learn along the way so um adjustments on the fly and just understanding and knowing that anything can change in the moment's notice so just having that versatility and 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 being thick-skinned enough to know like we got to go. We got to change. We got to move. We got to we got to do this. We got to do that. And we have to do it now. So um, I have loved every single minute of it. I've learned more in the last three years than I learned in the last 10 previous. Uh, and that's just the way that's just the way it is when you get to this level. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunities. Of course, you work with somebody very hands on in Tony Khan. How hands on are the actual wrestlers themselves? We know some have like their own licensed music that they got from the indies or that they just wanted to, to try and use that Tony's been cool and green lighting with. But do you ever work with like an Adam Cole or, or, you know, another wrestler that's coming in and say, OK, what do you like? What do you don't like? And kind of collaborate. Yeah. So everything is a case by case basis. Um, there's usually not a lot of time. Uh, so we have initial ideas and then I just I go to work immediately. Uh, I've, I've kind of learned in my workflow not to second guess anything. If I have the idea to do it, I put it down and then we we talk about it after the fact. Yeah. Uh, it, again, there's been times where I would talk directly with the talent and it's just the talent and I. There's times where it's just Tony and I. There's times where it's the three of us in a think tank and we just kind of bounce ideas back and forth. Uh, case in point, uh, Claudio just came in and debuted and uh, Tony was very adamant about the uh, the 1812 overture. Uh, cover like he wanted kind of like a rock cover to 1812 overture it would match kind of like the energy of the end of caddyshack but at the same time have a little bit more edge it would be a callback to claudio's time in ring of honor when he used the 1812 overture there and it would be a juxtaposition next to brian danielson's theme which is a, a hip-hop spin of uh, uh ride of the valkyrie so there was a lot that kind of went into it uh claudio was extremely receptive to it and the three of us kind of bounced around ideas and it kind of came to me, we had done a couple of passes and I was like, you're looking for 1812 Overture meets Andrew WK. And Tony said, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And it was right in front of my face because the NHL had been running promos all week long with Party Hard. So I was like, well, that's it. So I, I slept on it and woke up the next day, had it done before lunchtime. And everybody was like, this is perfect. And we were good to go. So it's it's amazing to have those opportunities to kind of understand what we're looking for. Um, I had somebody that's very close to our situation at AEW that said, there's, there's not many people that can run at the speed of Tony Khan. You are doing that. And uh, that says a lot about your versatility. And it's like, I don't even think about it. I just, I, my overall goal is to get the job done, make sure Tony's happy, make sure the talent's happy. And then everything else kind of falls into place after that. And it's definitely been falling into place. So, yeah, I mean, they run at a pretty fast pace. I mean, it's technically still a startup, right, three years in. So what's kind of like your average turnaround time for music if, like, a new superstar is debuting? The average is maybe a day or two. Um, we've had a couple that have gone a little bit longer, maybe four or five days. It's But it's very rare. And I learned very early in, in pro wrestling and in TV, like, 
TV, live TV is one thing. There's a lot of changes on the fly. Pro wrestling, there's a lot of changes on the fly. So when you take pro wrestling and you take live TV, there's a lot that could happen within the span of just, you know, it's always the moniker card is always subject to change, right? So when you live by that moniker, you're always ready in case something happens. And uh, a very prime example was our Halloween episode. Uh, where the elite was going to do a squid games presentation. We had the whole song done a couple of days before uh, we had done like a squid games inspired elite theme for Kenny and the bucks and Adam Cole and five 30, the night of the show, uh, I get a call that the squid games idea had been axed and we needed a ghostbuster style theme. And it was like, we got it's five 30. The show airs at eight. I was stuck in traffic until a little bit after six So I had mapped the whole thing out in my head before I got home. I got the song done, uh, had it delivered to the truck by uh, 80. I had Kenny had it at 801. The truck had it at 803. And then it premiered at the end of the show (laughs) for the main (laughs) event of the show an hour later. So, you know, those those are the things that happen. It, it, It provides just amazing stories after the fact. You don't think about it when you're in the middle of it because you're trying to get it done. But it's like. That's what we do. So the average is maybe around a day or two, um, but it's been as quick as a couple of hours. That's pretty incredible. And you had mentioned earlier that the last three years you've learned more than you had in, in the previous 10. And you have just such an incredible story. You're a father. You're a grandfather. You're a husband. You're somebody that's really hardworking. You talked about your journey on TikTok, how you worked in retail. And in addition to that, on the side, did music for over a decade. How did you stay hungry? How did you stay motivated, even when some opportunities weren't coming in until you got to AEW? I had kind of developed a workflow. You know, initially it had started because I needed supplemental income. Uh, I was working as a salary manager for big box retail. And uh, when you're in a store for 60, 70 hours a week, it doesn't really lend itself for you to go get a second part-time job to be able to clock in and clock out. Um, So I just decided in 2010 that I was going to start making music. And I, you know, I was kind of dabbling in in music at the time. I had never done anything professionally uh, that would bring in income. So I just, I decided this was what I was going to do. And it would kind of parlay into uh, different opportunities, different chances to work with different people, uh, have the music showcased in different areas. Uh, I worked with, in 2015, I worked with James Jetta and Zardonic, um, E1 Stablemates, uh, we produced the theme song for uh, World Series of Fighting, Bring It On, that had a great, great reaction and traction within the mixed martial arts realm. Uh, in 2016, that market started to kind of dry up a little bit. So I decided to move over to independent professional wrestling. That was booming at the time. There were a lot of independent wrestlers that were taking their brands into their own hands, using utilizing social media to create presence and create uh, the auras about themselves that they could take from one promotion to the next to the next. So I decided to get in on that and then just build it. And I was still working in retail at the time uh, and just developed this workflow where I always had a full queue of clients that I had to, to create music for. I was still working full time and I was already running. So that entire time was me developing the workflow and the, the, the skills that I needed to be able to work consistently and to work extremely fast. So it kind of brought all that to the moment of where I would join AEW. I didn't set out thinking that AEW was going to be the one because it, it, there was no concept of it until early 2019. But I knew at some point, if I just stayed consistent and stayed busy and continued to learn and continued to experiment and continue to produce that something was going to happen. It would be a video game or a major movie or something along the lines. And it just so happened that uh, I was in the right place at the right time. I had the right uh, resume. I had the right credit reel. And I had the right people speaking on my behalf, not just me speaking for myself. You got your big break at 43. A lot of people would have probably given up by then or felt like they wanted to give up by then. You had the resilience to say, no, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to keep going. I know if I do the right things, it's eventually going to happen. So the first big break was AEW. Then the second act of that, age 44, you signed your first true record deal with Monarch Music Group, aka E1. What was that whole moment like for you? Uh, that was actually a, a, a long process of negotiation. So, and it all kind of happened right at the, I want to say right at the set of the pandemic. So we had been talking for a while. And uh, when it all came through, like, 
all I thought about was just going to work and getting the job done. Like, I don't, there's some people that kind of like we stopped, my wife and I would stop and we celebrated those moments. We have those moments where we celebrate together. Um, but in terms of what comes after that, for me, it was just about going to work, going to work. Let's get it done. Let's put something out there. Let's make things happen. That's kind of the, uh, that's been my overall drive is getting it done and getting it out there for people to consume and for people to, to learn more about not just the stories that I'm telling, but uh, the overall encompass of entertainment itself. So um, yeah, I, there wasn't like the deal was the deal happened. My wife and I had a personal moment that we shared because we knew about the journey. And then it was just like, I appreciate in the moment and then just go to work. So, <laughs> and there's some people that, you know, there's some people that don't look at it that way. They take that moment and then sometimes they kind of linger on it and they want to continue to celebrate. And celebration is always great. And taking a moment to appreciate the journey is always great, but you still have more work to do. And when you get to that level, the work that you put in all the way up to that is three times more now that you're there, because now it's not about just saying I've made it. It's about maintaining and then going after even more because those, those higher stages, those bigger stages where people see more opportunities come. So you have to maximize and you have to capitalize on those moments and put the foot on the gas pedal all the way down. Like you think you had, you were flooring it before you got to put your foot all the way outside the car. You know, (laughs) if that makes any sense. What a story, man. Now, before we let you go, we always like to ask our guests some kind of random and rapid fire questions just to get to know them better. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Favorite I have late... no idea what you're going to ask me, by the way, so let's do it. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> Favorite late night snack or cheat meal? Oh, man. Uh, it's there's Yes, the answer is yes, everything. I, I like cheese nips. Um, I like chocolate cake. Me and Mrs. Ruckus like chocolate cake a lot. Um, but we're not supposed to be eating that stuff, but we do. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cheese nips, chocolate cake. All right. And ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be a hard one, but all-time favorite album. Is there like one album that you could just bump for like the rest of your life? I'll tell you right now, Faith No More, Angel Dust. All right. All right there you go. If you weren't a recording artist and a, and a producer, what would you be doing? But other than retail, if there was like another alternate multiverse where Mikey Ruckus was doing something else. I, I don't know. Probably making video games. Uh, you know, I, I that's something that always had intrigued me. Um, so it may not necessarily be music and games, just something involved in the gaming industry. So you're a gamer? Not heavily. I'm, I'm getting back into it again. I started doing Fortnite, uh, just because my, my son was playing it and screaming at the top of his lungs. And I got tired of going in there and telling him, if you don't shut up, I'm going to shut the game off. And I actually went in and shut the game off on him one time. And he started laughing hysterically. So <laughs> I decided to learn how to play it just so I could play with him. And then he wouldn't play. <laughs> so I do, I, I do some, uh, I do Fortnite. I want to get back into retro, uh, retro gaming. Uh, so that's something that's going to be coming down the pike very soon. Um, some retro gaming stuff and retro movies and, and things like that. The, the real important question, have you learned any of the Fortnite dances? Yeah, but you don't want to see them. <laughs> <laughs> tell you that right now you know you wouldn't want to see it it's not a pretty sight all right. All right. fair enough I, I don't know how much you talked to paul white but uh he's like a huge destiny player like in, in in the community he's like all about those first person shooters so hey maybe you could join his fire team he could ease you into the, the ps5 community oh for sure i'll have to hit him up uh i do pc right now but definitely i'll, I'll have to hit paul up I'll, I'll hit him up today as a matter of fact and, and ask him about it so we'll see cool cool Who's the funniest person backstage in AEW? Man, there are some characters back there. Uh, Hobbs, Hobbs has me like in stitches when I see him. Um, who else? There's a few. Hobbs, Dan Housen's really funny. Um, Starks is really funny. Anthony Agogo is really funny. It's just, I don't travel a lot, but when I see these guys, it's a joy to see them. Nyla Rose is hysterical. Uh, Serpentigo is hysterical. I, I, I love them. And they're just, they're happy all the way around and their, their vibes are always infectious. What's your most awkward moment as a music producer for AW? It would probably have to be my initial meeting of everybody. Once I had signed with the company, 
my first time meeting everyone was uh, for Fight for the Fallen in 2019 down in Jacksonville. We're at Daly's Place. I was in my first production meeting and I'm sitting around and I see, you know, Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks and and uh, Kenny Omega. And then I see Billy Gunn and then I see Dean Malenko. And and I I, I completely like after the meeting was over and everybody's kind of introducing themselves, everybody was being really nice to me. I went to go shake Dean Malenko's hand and I was trying to provide like some sort of a sidebar slash anecdote that I name dropped him in a song that I wrote for Zack Sabre Jr. and Ref Pro. But Dean Malenko was one of my favorite wrestlers when I was coming up. So when I went to go tell him, I drew a complete blank. And I was like, I name dropped you uh, uh, in a song I wrote. And I was like, and I can't believe that I'm completely just blanking out and i was like i really don't know why this is happening right now but i just wanted to tell you that i name dropped you in a song and he kind of looked at me he's like wow i have to buy you lunch (laughs) 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 and i walked away like oh my god (laughs) what did i just do so yeah that was by far the most awkward moment i had had Listen, I was a huge Dean Malenko fan as well. Back in the day, I got the PETA, the, the Pro Wrestling Illustrated issue when he was named number one in 97. I could understand, you know, the man of a thousand holds, you know, <laughs> sure, a sweet guy, but kind of intimidating at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a good guy, but I just, I completely botched that initial meeting. So now when I see him and he sees me, it's kind of like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> And we keep it moving. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's great. You, you recently made a, an Instagram post that, that was uh, very heartfelt about your wife. And I, I think it's very important for people to hear about why it's so important to have a supportive partner, whether that's a go-to person, like a, a best friend, a brother, a sister, a father-like figure, or, you know, a, a wife or life partner. So I'll ask you, how important is it to have a supportive partner in a journey like this? It's ab- it's absolutely vital. And it's an, it's a it's an absolute blessing. Um, you know, when my wife and I got together, like I, I knew my wife from high school. She was my high school crush. We both went on, uh, separate paths. I was married for 14 years. She was married for 14 years. Both of our marriages kind of ended at the same time. Didn't even know. And I was starting over from scratch. And and I was just telling somebody this, uh, earlier when I mean, starting over, I had, uh, a small two bedroom house with a couch. And that was it. I had nothing else. Like I was starting from zero and uh, she and I kind of went on this journey together. And there were times where I felt like, what am I doing here? And uh, very consequential, consequently, maybe three weeks before AEW was announced, I almost walked away from music altogether. Uh, I just figured, you know, I'm, I'm burning out. I'm working seven days a week. You know, I had a, a really strong workflow where I was working 60, 70 hours in my store. And then I was going home every night after work and working in my office six and seven hours in, in the evening. And this was going on for six, seven days a week for almost two years. And I was just kind of burnt out. And I started kind of rationalizing, like, you know, maybe my little slice of life in retail isn't so bad. You know, I, I have a great team. I, I'm in a great community. Uh, you know, I, I love the clientele. I love the people that are there. Maybe this is okay. And I've kind of brought that up in conversation. She basically, in so many words, told me that I was crazy. Um, and she's like, you know, you would never, you would never have any peace ever because you have worked too hard to walk away from this. So I kind of slept on it. Um, I didn't make any rash decisions or anything like that. I I took a day just to kind of relax. And then I went back to work again. And then literally like three weeks later, I saw the tweet from Dustin Rhodes talking about how proud he was of his brother and the launch of this. And that's when I saw AEW. And I I just knew deep down inside that the gig was mine. So um, I just, I, I made the moves that I needed to make to network to get there. And, you know, I floated the idea of coming to work full-time as opposed to uh, doing a handful of songs. I said, you know, listen, you guys are, you guys are going to need this forever. So I'll come in, I'll work here forever. And uh, I just kind of floated it. I didn't think they they would go for it and they went for it. And just to think it was only a few weeks before that I was thinking about just walking away from everything and then just focusing on being a retail guy and thinking that that's not so bad after all. So she was very instrumental in saying, Hey, you know, I know you, 
I know what you've put into this and I know what this means to you. There may not necessarily be an end goal that we see right now, but you need to keep doing what you're doing. So it's, it made, it made the difference in the world. She's, she is my absolute best friend and she gets, she gets what we're doing here. She gets what I'm doing. And uh, she's always been 1000% supportive. So very vital. I love that. So she's the real MVP. She is the real MVP. And how cool is it that you can have a significant other that says, I think you need that for your studio. And I'm like, all right. And then I turn around and it's there. So <laughs> good stuff. Definitely good stuff. Well, Mikey, we really do appreciate the time. Before we let you go, let's get you out of here on another high note. What's the best piece of advice you give for success? I would definitely say uh, start small. Try experiment. Don't beat yourself up. If you fail, I, I tell people that L's aren't losses, they're lessons. So always understand that the journey is what is going to make you. It's not necessarily uh, reaching the stars or putting all your eggs in one basket. It's about the process. It's about appreciating what is being afforded to you in that moment, maximizing that, and then using that to, for the next step. And the next step and the next step. So it's uh, it's always just that long process. Start small, take your baby steps, take your lumps, take your bruises, and then learn and just take that with you. It's like a suit of armor that you carry into battle with you every day. Well said. Amazing stuff, man. It was a pleasure to talk to you, to learn about your journey. Much respect to everything you're doing that you're going to do. The floor is yours, man. Where can we find you online and where can we find you next? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere. You can find me on, uh, on Twitter, um, uh, Mikey Ruckus. You can find me on TikTok, Mikey Ruckus. You can find me on Instagram, Mikey underscore Ruckus, R-U-K-U-S. I am as interactive as I could possibly be uh, every, every day. Um, you're going to see, uh, different things coming up on YouTube where I start opening up to the processes like I do on TikTok a little bit more in depth about, uh, just production best practices and being able to impart wisdom to up and coming producers that uh, may not necessarily have the opportunities that uh, that I had had or in, in the same sense, uh, being able to provide opportunities where I didn't necessarily have them. I had to go out and find them out on my own. So I'm there. I'm out there. You just type in Mikey Ruckus. You'll find me. Easy enough. And of course, he hears music on pretty much everything AEW, including AEW Dynamite on TBS and AW Rampage on TNT. Mikey, thank you so much.